Hey guys, quick question. Uh, who here wants to hire more people? Who here thinks that better sourcing is going to help you hire more people? Who here thinks that better closing will help you hire more people? Okay, cool. Um, when I first started out in recruiting, I was infatuated with the concept of closing. I wanted to be a great closer. I had a vision for these magical words kind of uh, pouring out of my mouth. Um, I loved all the closing movies, sales related movies. Um, I had a vision for what I wanted to be. In, in, in recruiting. Um, what ended up happening though is a much different version uh, than, than, than what I imagined. Um, my boss would put me in these really tough situations. They made me feel uncomfortable. Um, he'd make me try to close people by the end of day Friday when I could tell they wanted a week to think about it. Just really unnatural things um, that I, I didn't want to do, but I eventually figured out a way to push through it. I ended up you know, developing a reasonably successful career as an agency recruiter. I figured out a way to adapt uh, what needed to be done on the closing front to my personal style. Fast forward eight years, three years ago, to what we refer to as Bing 2.0. Um, you know, what Dan was talking about, it's essentially it's a hybrid version of agency recruiting and in-house recruiting. Uh, we go on site to companies and help them scale up really aggressively. Uh, the, the key to what we do working is we sign up for a number of hires within a certain amount of time, and it has to work. Like, there's no choice but for it to work. So. It worked the first time, worked the second time, we started hiring recruiters, and then we found ourselves in a situation. And the situation was, how do we create this predictability, this repeatability, this ability to deliver on a consistent basis, but with newbie recruiters, like recruiters who aren't you know, battle-tested the way maybe you know, myself and our other you know, experienced recruiters um, may have been. So we ended up figuring out ways to bottle up Closing, I'm sorry, bottle up sourcing, bottle up candidate management, client management, like some of the things that are very trainable and, um, and, and, and repeatable. But when it came to closing, we were stuck. Okay, so this is what Scooby Doo looks like on a 40 foot screen right here. Um, so, what we were able to do is we take, took the concept of closing, we boiled it down to some basic essentials, in, in our opinion, and we created a, a framework, a process. Um, put up two question marks because essentially our closing process. Um, is the asking of two questions. And we ask these two questions on a very repeat basis. Um, we ask this to all of our candidates. We ask this to all of our candidates at every stage in their process. Um, I ask it of candidates. I ask my recruiters to ask it of their candidates. I ask my recruiters these two questions about their candidates. We ask our hiring manager to um, rate the candidates against these two questions. Um, you guys wanna know what the two questions are? What are the questions? Okay, cool. Question number one, on a scale of one to 10, with one being no way in hell, and 10 being ready to sign, where are you? Remember, we ask this to our candidates at every step in the process. So that means when we first meet a candidate, we ask them this question. And if we, of course, get our you know, crazy looks, but we ask them this question, so we start closing as a conversation. We, we, we use this as a means to kind of rail, um, or to be a rail kind of through the, through the process. The second question is, why? Why did you pick that number? On a scale of one to 10, one being no in hell, 10 being I'm ready to accept the offer, where are you? And the second question is, is why? And it's important you ask these questions uh, exactly as they are uh, stated. It's not on a scale of one to 10, how excited are you? It's not on a scale of one to 10, uh, you know, do you want this job? It's on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you to sign this offer? It makes the closing process very deliver but deliberate, very transparent, um, and, um, it's kind of refreshing to be able to talk about it. Ends up being a little bit of like a monkey on the process's back um, when, when you actually bring it up. Um, so one thing that's important to, to point out, as I'm sure you guys were all thinking, um, is okay, what's up with this number and how do you know that your candidates are actually telling you the truth? So there are a couple different versions of this number. There's your version of the number. As a recruiter, you might try to figure out whether candidates are a six or a five or a three or a whatever, and then your candidates are gonna have a different uh, version of this number as well. Somewhere between the two is the truth. And, and your goal is to try to figure out where the truth is, what the truth is, and then what to ultimately do about it. So we're gonna go through a couple of different scenarios and just kind of talk through the uh, set of numbers and what they mean and, and, and what to do when you're at any of those kind of various stages. So one obviously being no way in hell. This is usually when 
you know, you're looking at a list of candidates that you've never talked to. Those are the no way in hell candidates because they don't know anything about you, right? So when you reach out to a one, uh, what is your goal in that situation? Your goal is to make them a four or a two, at least a two. You want to, you want to at least get up to the point where you have a shot, okay? Um, when you're a two, that's usually when you're, um, you know, doing your first pitch. Uh, when a candidate responds to your in-mail and says, sure, I'll talk to you, that's a two. That's about as good as your odds are at that, uh, at that point. Three to four is when you start getting into some real kind of meat and potatoes of the process. This is where you should be either um, validating that people should be continuing through the process, or you should be very aggressively moving people out of the process. Again, this is all about time management. It's all about odds. It's all about knowing where your candidate is in the process, so you can help them kind of best manage this situation moving forward. Um, so when we talk to our recruiters, and we say on a scale of one to 10, where is your candidate? They say, my candidate is at a four. I know that that generally means they don't know very much about the opportunity yet. We're still working through the logistic stage of the process. It helps me as a, as a, you know, as a business owner of a 25 recruiter firm, um, and I imagine of, of, of you guys as um, you know, directors of recruiting of large talent orgs, it helps you kind of better budget your recruiting output. When you have a sense of you know, 100 candidates in process, 75% uh, of them are at fours, okay, I know that I'm pretty early in this, uh, in this closing cycle. Whereas if you had 75% of them at eights, for example, uh, you know you're in a little bit of a better spot. You could help the business better understand the likelihood of somebody, um, you know, a certain number of hires being made. Um, so once you're past three to four, you're at five, which is the second worst place on this scale that you could be. Um, five is no good because it's a cop-out. It's, it's the equivalent of a neutral hire uh, recommendation, and you guys all know that those are pretty meaningless. So whenever someone tells me that they're a five, I say, okay, good answer. Let's pretend that five wasn't an option. Are you a four or a six? And then they have to kind of lean in or lean out um, whenever it is that uh, they're, asked that, they're asked that question. Um, the goal of someone who tells you that they're a five is to, is to do exactly that. Lean them in and start talking about the later stages of the process, or if they say they're a four, then that's a great opportunity to start talking about why they're a four. Maybe they're not ready. Maybe, they're, uh, maybe they're, they don't know enough about the opportunity. Whatever it is, it's a great opportunity to have a dialogue about what it is that's, uh, that's happening. So once you get into six or seven, uh, you're into the later stages of the process. This is pretty natural. Uh, this is when the candidate comes into the onside. This is when they're first meeting with the team. This is when, if you've paced your process correctly, uh, this is when candidates start developing a short list. You can start talking to your candidates about their short list. If they say they're a six or a seven, but they're still interviewing with 15 companies, they're not really a six or a seven. You want to start helping them understand how to get to that kind of place in their process. Um, again, this is, this is what the six or seven is, uh, is, is about. Um, the next move up to eight is, is an important milestone in this closing process. Um, what most people do is breeze right through eight and they assume that right after they um, finish the on-site, it's offer time. And then they're putting together their closing strategy and they're doing all these great things that are pretty natural for a company, but the big miss that happens is they forget to ask the candidate, um, do they want the job without the money? Because um, what happens with the money, it starts to confuse things. It starts to get kind of muddled in people's minds and people forget the first reason, or the reason in the first place why they're considering the opportunity in the first place. I was just talking to one of our recruiters outside. She has a closing situation. Company's really excited about the candidate. Um, candidate seems to be interested, <coughs> seems to be interested enough in, in the company. Um, the, um, the, the, the recruiter sent out an email with where the candidate is and all these different kind of criteria to get the candidate to join. The company comes right back over the top and very naturally says, what's it gonna take? How much money do we need to offer? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great coaching opportunity for, for myself and, and our recruiter to say, let's not forget to find out if they're at eight. Do they want the job money aside before we start getting into the, into the money? It could feel like a little bit of an annoyance for the candidate who wants to just get into the money part, but it's a great opportunity to pause and, and talk about whether or not they're at eight. If they're not at eight, that's when you could infuse things like sell calls with the hiring managers, um, you know, lunches with the team, whatever it is so they can understand, do they want the job money aside? And then once they know that they do, then we can get into the money stuff. So that's stage nine. Stage nine is when you start talking about uh, money. It's when you extend offers. 
It's when you, um, it's when you confirm comp, it's when you confirm equity, it's when you have that kind of moment of truth with the candidate and say, are, 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 we, are we now ready to do this at these terms, et cetera, et cetera. So is everybody ready for what happens after nine? Okay, 9.9. .9. This is the worst place that you could possibly be. Raise your hand if you've ever had a candidate 99% sure they are ready to accept your job, right? This is like your worst nightmare playing out in your mind, right? If you're an agency recruiter, you spend your commission. If you are an in internal recruiter, your team's already been promised, right? The person is gonna join. Usually this means one, one of two things. Uh, one, they either, um, there's one, something big in three or four, or six or seven that you missed, right? You forgot to validate the commute, you forgot to validate the relocation, uh, you forgot to you know, confirm with them how their family feels about the decision. Whatever it is that happened is, is one scenario. The other scenario is you did such a good job bonding with this person that this is the best job this person could do at not breaking your heart. And that's what this person thinks they're doing. They're not breaking your heart by telling you they're a 9.9. .9. Uh, what usually follows is an email within 24 hours letting you down. Um, so what you do when you're at a 9.9 .9 is you call them on it and you tell them that this is the worst possible place that we could be right now and we have to talk about it. And then you start talking about it and, and then the candidate opens up and you know, things start to happen. Um, so after 9.9, .9, you're at 10 and half the people in the audience will get this and half won't. But you do the Elaine Bennis dance if you're around in the 90s and never watched Seinfeld. And that completes this talk.